be here today, and thank you to the English department and to Ali Beidad for making that possible. I am so excited to be joining the faculty here in, in as of July 1st. Um, okay, so for my response to this extraordinarily rich and really moving set of papers, I wanted to try to highlight what I saw as two major chords and one minor key, moving across and also looping through this afternoon session. So just to give a kind of synopsis of what will come. The first of these is what I see as post-industrial bodies and ecologies, but also socio-cultural as well as som somatic formations that cross-pollinate with but prove to be not fully amenable to or assimilatable to post-industrialism. The second of the two major words, as I'm calling them, are problems in politics of scale, or what actually Michelle this morning suggested we call the politics of scale hopping, which I really like and I've been thinking about a lot since the morning session. And then finally, the minor key that is explicit in Hannah Landecker's and Diane Nelson's papers, but at least to my food-obsessed brain, uh, dancing around the prickly of Melinda Cooper and the Sean scholarship is that of uh, what I'm thinking of is food as poison, food as cure, and food as information, these three sort of modalities. So I'll then end by posing two or three questions that are kind of big picture to the panel as a whole that I hope will kick off our discussion, if only partially first. Okay, so for the first, the post-industrial bodies and ecologies board. All four of the panelists this afternoon offer theoretically provocative, but also very richly historicized accounts of bodies and environments and of medical research subjects and medical care practices under post-industrial regimes. The notes forming this major part of the panel are threefold. Lived experiences, but also institutional infrastructures of networks, juridical and biotechnical forms of service work and contract labor, and then systems of regula regulation, but I would think also importantly, deregulation, and the attendant problems of risk Exposure, mitigation, insurance, and redress. Uh, and I, I'm really now sort of fascinated by um, Diane's final comments about the Limited Liability Corporation, the LLC. Uh, and that led to a kind of cascading set of questions for me about liability, but also in, indemnity. And then something like the current debate on veggie libel laws. So libel as maybe another um, articulation of what you were getting at. <coughs> Excuse me, I just came from Oregon where I have terrible allergies this time of year, so you have to bear with me a little bit. So in tracing um, the four bioscience research areas related to the changing science of metabolism, Hannah argues that the past two decades have ushered in, quote, a transition from a fortis gene to a networked gene, end quote. By her account, the metabolic body has shifted from a machine that turns the molecular content of food to fuel via discrete time-bound transactions into a circuit or node in a dynamic system of exchange occurring at multiple scales from the molecular to the environmental. And I think here she's very much in conversation with communication scholar Thierry Cardini and his recent book, Jump Where, which I'd like to hear more how you think about his arguments um, in his two parts, the molecular and the molecular. She's showing us that this information framework emerging from cell biology and epigenetic research has both empirical and political ramifications. The framework makes the metabolism, quote, a dynamic web of cellular signals built by and responding to environmental information, food or foods pollutants, end quote. Thus, fine, funneling bioscience research to certain R&D projects and not to others, specifically to treatment of obesity, diabetes, and other so-conceived regulatory and actually, the critique going on in cultural geography, especially right now, of the very term obesity epidemic is something I would love to hear um, Hannah and others' thoughts about. And I'm thinking particularly of Julie Guffman's recent book on the language of obesity, slow food movement, and food justice. Switching to uh, Melinda Cooper's work, in her long gray and cross-national history of clinical trials, she's making the case for understanding medical research subjects as we heard her say so elegantly, to be post-industrial laborers who lack the juridical protection of workers' compensation, which they in effect sign away to informed consent. <coughs> the privatization, outsourcing, and monetized recruitment strategies of Big Pharma show us in a sense 
the apotheosis of a deregulated and neoliberal world economy. Her analysis probes the racialized and gender dimensions of the clinical trial process since the, quote, prison industrial pharmaceutical complex has given rise to the contract research organization, end quote. While phase one trial recruits often are impoverished and undocumented men of color, and, are, and they are recruited into a somatic work that is analogous to informal and day labor. Phase two and phase three trials often enlist middle class but un or underinsured white women who see their labor as part of a voluntary, voluntary or altruistic framework. And yet this also, as we heard, provides often health care, but one that is contingent and unpredictable. For her part, Meishan draws on but also intervenes, I think, really productively in STS to contest the bifurcation of experiential medicine and biomedicine. Her account of TCM shows how beginning in the 50s it became professionalized as doctors like Dr. Shen trained in biomedicine were enlisted to lead these TCM schools, to write textbooks, and in a sense to verify the science of TCM practice. The state-sponsored reformation of TCM, she writes, has excluded those very practices being too superstitious or too unscientific and thus in a sense, ushered TCM into a post-industrial but also a nationalist ideology of evidence, materiality, and applied science. And the contradictions among some of the um, investments of TCM as it's professionalized, I found really interesting and would love to hear you um, elaborate on. So within this kind of um, note of the post-industrial regime and how these various practices um, are informed by it, resist, I was particularly interested in this question of risk and also this conflict between regulation and deregulation. Beginning with Hannah's observation that her account of American metabolism reveals a biology of risk at work. For Melinda, clinical trial participation, as we heard, is a form of risk-bearing labor that depends on the eventual time of metabolic exposure. Here we may also think of the politics of time and the ideas and infrastructures of latency that come up this morning. An interesting moment, I thought, of consonance between clinical trials and extractive industries occurs when at the end of her essay, Diane speaks to the body of tort law that is also so central to Melinda's history of how and why clinical trial participants are excluded from workers' compensation and remain, in a sense, within a tort framework, made, in a sense, all but moot by the informed consent form. So on the one hand, they're in the tort framework of injury, injury um, and yet they sign away most of their rights to take advantage of or access such a framework, at least as I understood your argument. As for post genocide Guatemala and extractive industries like open mountain mining for gold, Diane suggests that the tort framework may in fact serve the anti-mining coalition and the wider environmental injustice, justice movements of which it is a part. She writes, in this system it is immoral not to defend oneself against those who injure you. The numbers assembled with this logic of fault and lashing together some tenacious lawyers, a UN convention and an inter-American court led to the May 20th, 2010 ruling that the mine was illegal and should be closed. As of this writing, however, the government has said it needs more time to study the case. Uh, and so I think that, you know, that brings together a number of the claims you're making about evidence and the, the disconnect between the technologies of evidence available, the, the sort of legal infrastructure available, and the outcomes. But both Diane and May, I think, are chronicling communities and temporalities that are not fully linked up with, in the sense of networked or jacked into post-industrialism and its binaries of regulation, deregulation, investment, disinvestment, accumulation, offloading, and risk exposure, risk mitigation. And what I found particularly striking here in both Diana and May's work is that metaphor and analogy are the modes through which a resistance to the post-industrial occurs. So in Diane's work, analogies and alchemical metaphors make equivalences of blood and gold, people and commodities, mineral and food. These rhetorical tactics can do political work, as when the organizer Anaceto speaks, quote, our health is in danger, the tailings dam, it is open to the sun, we breathe this air and it is changing our bodies. And then the metaphor, the soil is a filter. In May's paper, her transdisciplinary approach to PCM aims, quote, to suspend gendered and hierarchical divisions of labor between the analyzer and the analyzed. 
but also between the conceptual and the empirical. In some senses, these are the fundamental divisions on which post-industrial societies have formed. She shows how TCM challenges the very notions of evidence and proof that are so central to biomedicine and does so through metaphor, analogy, but also experience. And this comes out in her longer analysis of when it's, I think, most uh, striking. So much more briefly, the second two points I wanted to make. Uh, first, scale. I think this really speaks to the session subtitle of cross-border intimacies, uh, which in my mind sort of is doing that kind of scale hopping, uh, the idea of sort of geographical, uh, geological, planetary scale, but also intimacies of, of sort of multiple kinds. Consider together the bodies of research we are getting to preview this afternoon explore what we can see about the gendered and racialized contours of biomedical research, but also natural resource extraction and medical care. And they're asking us, what, how, how do we see these um, practices and institutions anew if we attend to multiple scales at once and if we rethink habituated scales of analysis? For example, Diane's ethnographic narrative of mountaintop removal, gold mining in Guatemala moves us from the open pit and the neoliberal economy to the hauntingly small scale of an ounce of gold. And at the same time, the individual voices of anti-mining indigenous Guatemalas who are trying to be counted and to, in their collectivity, counter the scale of the mining company in the mine. Or consider Hannah's discussion of recent biology research and nutrition marketing about the family of proteins known as sirtuins, sir okay, which are believed to contribute to health and longevity and that respond to small molecular activators found in food. Here, what appears to be a metabolic relation happening at the time scale of the cell also, quote, articulates with the life cycle and moreover opens the metabolic body out onto quote, an environment composed of other organisms. But in biomedical and also medical care context, scale takes on yet another set of concerns about the aggregation of data and bodies and the generalizability of practices or therapies. Thus does each phase of the clinical trial process scale up while also disenfranchising some communities from participating at the successive scale or stage. And thus, too, does the professionalization of PCM work to generalize what is a practice of the specific? In response to that push, May shows as TCM doctors resist the scale of generalization and abstraction. They are, quote, experts in thinking and doing in the specific who approach illness in all its environmental, social, and personal dimensions. And then finally, most people have all have my time. Okay. So I want to gesture this minor key. Uh, if scale and sort of various responses to this industrial are the major chords that I that I heard here, there was this minor key of food, which I see everywhere. So <laughs> it's partly my own research interest, probably um, that's at, at the center of that. Nonetheless, I saw food kind of coming up in these three senses of poison, of cure, or more specifically as the medium of treatment, therapy, and care, and then finally as information. So this is explicit in Hannah and Diane's papers in, in different ways, and I would love to sort of put these in the conversation when we have our discussion. In her analysis, as we've heard, Hannah analyzes the signal and signaling processes that are so important in metabolic science today, showing us that one conceptual origin for contemporary discourses of food um, is in this sort of idea of the signal. And it helps us understand how food comes in the 21st century to be simultaneously the source of all ills and the font of all cure, uh, cures. She writes, a signal is amenable to capitalization, pharmaceutical development, and IP protection. It is the image of a discrete compound that can be taken or not, prescribed or bought, that stands at some important fork in the signaling pathways. The signal then is the hinge between inside and outside, eating and time, sugar and longevity, basic and implied, food and meaning. And here I was particularly interested in the simultaneous sense of food as treatment and food as information here. And to what extent food as information is licensing this sort of incredible R&D investment in functional foods and food as medicine and so on. I'll return here shortly. Meanwhile, in this very different context, Diane reveals that food as poison is informing many of the metaphors of mining and extractive industries. And then, fascinating to me, at the same time, food is the literal medium that draws people together. 
Both of the cookouts that the Gold Corp Mining Corporation organized to build community support or the appearance of community support, and at the anti-mining rallies and meetings. So that sort of metaphorical and very material, literal function of food in this ethnography you're doing, I would be really curious to hear a bit more about. So this current around the science and discourses of food and biopolitical times led me to query where we might see food cropping up in the work of Melinda and May. And here I'm thinking especially the rise of superfoods and functional foods and the increasing market for big pharma in food as medicine. Um, or alternatively, medicines that regulate the metabolic body. Uh, so in that sense, are intervening in the, the eating body. Um, and I just, I'd be curious if any of the research you've done on clinical trials, if that has sort of come up, that particular body of research, experimentation, and drug development <coughs> around sort of functional food uh, discourses. But then, of course, food as medicine has been important to TCM in very different ways. Um, in herbal medicine, but I would imagine in, in a lot of different senses we might think about that. And to what extent can we maybe put big pharma and TCM into conversation along that, along that axis? So this final thread is, I think, more gestural and certainly much less fleshed out uh, than the other two, but I wanted to raise it as a kind of final um, launching, point, launching point. So then I'll just end here with perhaps like, these three big picture questions that I'll pose to the panel, and uh, that hopefully we can open up from there. So first is interventions in the post-industrial. How do you see the distinct contributions, but also the cross-pollinations among STS, environmental justice, feminist critique, and critical race studies. I, I was really sort of interested in thinking about methodology and disciplinary as well as transdisciplinary lenses here on, on the range of topics. Um, and sort of related to this, I'm wondering about what the role of ethnography is in um, what I sort of define as the politics of scale hopping, building on Michelle's term from the morning. Um, is this a kind of organizing rubric for the, these very diverse bodies of research, um, scale hopping? And a kind of final maybe question about discipline and methodology here is sort of how might we compare the, um, the lens of ethnography, the work of ethnography, to that of sociology of science or uh, uh, epistemo epistemology of science that are sort of represented in the range of papers as well. And then a final question which sort of shifts in a very different direction is I'd ask all of you how you understand the kind of cross-border exchanges among bioscience R&D, whether we're talking about the NIH-funded war on obesity or the World Bank-supported extractive industry. So bioscience R&D on one hand and social activism on the other. I found myself thinking a lot, actually, across the whole day about the place of activism in all of this research um, against, alongside, in conversation with R&D as this is other big term that hasn't really come directly yet. So I think there's so many more places to go, but I'll end there. Thank you so much. For